All right, it's time to begin our next panel. We're going to be talking about hitching a ride, commercial human spaceflight, enabling research and science. This is a commercial human space. The commercial human spaceflight providers will enable unprecedented opportunities for low-cost research and science. This panel will discuss what's available now and what's coming soon that will increase access to microgravity environments for a longer spectrum of investigators and studies. The session is generously sponsored by Aerospace Corporation and Blue Origin. Our moderator, and we really have to be careful with Phil in giving his uh, title, our moderator, Phil McAllister, McAllister, I'm sorry, is currently the Director of Commercial Space Flight for NASA headquarters. He's probably had more titles than me, and he's been steadily moving forward with the commercial space flight activity in NASA over the past eight or 10 years. So Phil, go ahead and take the panel. Okay, thanks very much, Alan, and welcome everybody to Hitching a Ride. I really like the way this panel was described um, because it shows the combination of people and what they're gonna be doing on orbit. Uh, I think that's really the key. Um, more people that can go to space, they're going to want to do more things. And when you can do more things, that's going to attract more people. And I really do see it as sort of this synergistic relationship between kind of people and payloads. And if you think about it, now is the perfect time to have this panel because we are so tantalizingly close. Uh, you can almost taste it that we are on the cusp of this sort of inflection point uh, with our ability to transport um, humans to low Earth orbit. If you think about it, after wheel stop of the space shuttle program in 2011, we went 10 years without the ability to launch people into orbit. And now in less than a year, about 11 months, we've now had three missions uh, to the International Space Station uh, with people. And so it's been a really exciting time. Now we've got Blue Origin announcing ticket sales. Virgin Galactic is right, uh, is very close to having commercial operations. Hopefully Boeing will be certified very soon. So very, very exciting time. It's, I think it's always been exciting for this, uh, th those of us in the biz, but we've always sort of postulated about this expansion in the, of the number of people and the things that they will do, but we haven't had the transportation systems to enable that. And so now after years of hard work, developing these systems, we're about to see how this will actually play out in reality. And our panelists uh, are gonna talk about how they see that playing out uh, for you. We've really got the A-team today. Uh, um, starting off, we'll go with Sarisha Bandla. She is Vice President of Government Affairs for Virgin Galactic. And then Christian Meander, Director of In Space and Manufacturing for Axiom Space. Tommy Samford, Executive Director, Commercial Space Flight Federation, and then batting cleanup will be Dr. Erica Wagner, Payload Sales Director for Blue Origin. So with that, Sarisha, take it away. Thanks, Phil. Um, awesome to be here. I was about to say, nice to see everyone, but I can't see, any, I can't see anybody besides the wonderful faces of my fellow panelists. So nice to be in everyone's presence. And thanks to AAS for putting together the Goddard Symposium. Uh, one of my, uh, an event I attend every year. Um, so I'm looking forward to having um, conversations. Uh, Phil, I think you set it up well. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about suborbital space um, as, to, uh, as opposed to orbit, but I know Christian will talk a lot about orbital uh, capabilities. Um, so uh, I'm Sarisha Banla. I work for Virgin Galactic and Virgin Galactic's core business is to fly people and payloads to space and back. Um, our purpose being to open space up for everyone um, for the purpose of tourism or flying uh, researchers uh, for the, uh, to enable microgravity research, whether it's for scientific purposes, uh, technology development or education. Um, and for, for those of you that don't know, uh, Virgin Galactic operates a hybrid vehicle, um, which is um, a vehicle that is comprised, or a platform that is comprised of an aircraft and a spacecraft. So we have a mothership that takes up our spacecraft to uh, a high altitude before release and the spacecraft itself makes the journey to space and comes back and lands on a runway like, uh, like an aircraft or a glider. Um, and one area I'm just really excited about and I know uh, everyone on this panel shares this enthusiasm is the uh, ability to fly researchers with their payloads, um, that human tended research capability. Um, it's just such an exciting area, and we've seen a lot of enthusiasm from the research community um, of that prospect of flying with their payloads, being able to 
make real time observations, make adjustments uh, in real time as well, um, and just generally interact with their payload uh, in a way uh, that, you know, uh, minimizes some of the complexity of having someone else do it and also in general minimizes the complexity of the payload itself as opposed to an autonomous payload. Um, so we've seen a lot of enthusiasm from the community um, on those flights and as our vehicles, um, vehicles of, our, of my fellow panelists uh, move towards commercial operations, you'll see the cadence of those opportunities happen at a much higher rate than you're, you're seeing now. And I think the opportunities, uh, the research community will be seizing those opportunities for a variety of purposes. Um, so one other item I'll probably just mention um, before I stop uh, is of course the education aspect um, that all of our vehicles are enabling. Um, of course, we can fly education payloads to, to space, um, but with the onset of commercial human spaceflight vehicles, the diversity of the people we're going to be flying to space um, is one that we haven't seen before. They'll be coming from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures, uh, different geographic locations. And I truly believe all of the people, whether it's for tourism or for research, will go back and have an impact on their community. Um, whether they directly um, you know, uh, have contact and uh, talk to students or not, I think they will have an impact. Um, we all look up to, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say we all, I looked up to people uh, that have been to space. I looked up to astronauts growing up because that's the community I wanted to be a part of. Um, and you know, it's so much easier to look up to someone and to aspire to be uh, following their footsteps if you share a piece of your identity with them. And I think we'll see this downstream effect of the next generation of students that pursue uh, careers in STEM and especially the aerospace community uh, from the number and the diversity of people that will be flying to space uh, on our vehicle. So uh, with that, I'll stop and I look forward to any questions and uh, discussion with, with the panel. All right, thanks, Sarisha. Uh, on to Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you for AAS to putting this on uh, every year. And Phil, thanks for including me in part of the panel. Um, I, I wanna share a little bit about Axiom Space. Um, we talk about the, the spectrum of access to LEO and we, we are here to essentially enable that first, that first expanded access to low Earth orbit from a sustained perspective. We're building the world's first commercial space station um, and we're doing so to echo a lot of what um, Sarisha just said. We're building that to really enable kind of a thriving home in space that benefits humans everywhere. And so we're really looking at, at how do we expand the frontier in low Earth orbit by providing the infrastructure that is needed to service a, a thriving economy. And so um, we're doing so by building that first commercial destination in space. It's going to be uh, what we, we uh, very creatively call it Axiom Station right now, and it is a modular space station, and it's really designed to increase access for both people and economic activities in low Earth orbit. Um, when you look at the emerging sectors in low Earth orbit, you really, if you're building a space station of this magnitude and with the capital that it requires, you really have to make sure you diversify your, your revenue portfolio. So not only are we enabling access for uh, humans to travel to space, and that can either be private astronauts or professional astronauts, either from partner countries with the ISS or even new countries that want to become part of the spacefaring League of Nations. Uh, we're also enabling access to space for continued and expanded research opportunities, uh, in-space manufacturing opportunities, uh, the ability to test uh, and, and try out technologies that might be needed to go for exploration needs for Moon or Mars, and even open up the frontier to a greater array of low Earth orbit services um, uh, that, that need to be done in order to enable, for example, the greater network of satellites that are, are going up on orbit today and the greater amount of data that's going to flow through space, both in low Earth orbit and, and to cislunar and beyond. And so, we're building a space station, this first project, to really be many things. It's, it's in some ways, it's going to be a hotel, it's going to be a training facility, it's going to be a research lab, and it's going to be a factory floor. And so it requires a lot of uh, creative thinking in terms of how you put that together. But our goal really is, is about increasing access to space. And that's 
We're building the space station uh, modularly, and we're going to start doing that off the ISS. We're going to attach our first modules to the to no two forward port of the ISS starting in 2024. So we immediately will bring more space to the ISS stack, enabling a, a greater amount of research and activity in orbit. Um, our traffic to orbit will increase flights to space. Increase flights to space hopefully will reduce costs over time for the, the cost of getting to space. And our module, the design for our space station over time allows us to add capability as markets grow. So we have the ability to size up as markets expand. And so at some point when we leave the ISS and become a free flying space station, um, we'll have the ability to grow as the market grows. We're also trying to simplify access to space. And that's an important feature because the easier the interface that you can create for the customer, the, the researcher that wants to get to orbit, the faster they can get there, the, the less schedule they have to spend doing it, really transforming the research arena from not just an academic model that really supports research over a two to three year cycle, but a commercial model that really works to a fiscal year. And then finally, lowering cost. We're really trying to drive um, a design that provides interfaces that look just like a scientist laboratory on the ground, or just like a manufacturer's factory floor on the ground. Providing those interfaces really lowers uh, a customer's cost to get to orbit. Uh, it helps them simplify their design, and they get to focus on what's important, uh, which is the techniques and tools that they need to fly. So our attachment to the space station ultimately uh, provides what is perhaps the most important thing for a growing economy, and it's a smooth transition. Um, attaching ourselves to the ISS with our space station not only enables customers using the ISS today to physically transfer over to commercial space station over time, but it also really lets us optimize and maximize the, the, the final uses of the International Space Station. Without that attachment and separation from a, with a commercial module, there could be a downturn in the activity on ISS because customers don't want to fly only to operate for a few short years. But now that Axiom is going to be part of the the uh, stack for quite some time, there's this transition plan that, that it enables, and which means that business plans that are developed around uh, starting at ISS can ultimately transfer over into Axiom Station. So uh, I'll close there for now and just offer up the, the, that um, I think I'm excited about the spectrum of opportunities that are opening up here. And I, I really resonate with what Phil said about we are just so tantalizing, tantalizingly close to what we're doing. And we're looking forward to our first private mission to the space station in uh, January of next year, where we're bringing up some, some of our first private astronauts to orbit. And with them, uh, uh, a big complement of research as well that's going to really expand uh, the capabilities that we think we have. So I'll turn it over back to you, Phil. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Christian, very good. Uh, next up is Tommy. Great. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank uh, AES for hosting this great conference every year and thank Blue Origin and the Aerospace Corporation for sponsoring and putting this timely topic together. I'd also like to thank Phil for moderating and uh, for fellow panelists, Sarisha Christian and Erica for uh, a great discussion. Um, uh, so far, uh, my fellow panelists have done a great job at discussing what's available now and what's coming soon. Uh, with regard to increasing access to microgravity environments for a larger spectrum of investigators and studies. Full disclosure, they're also all CSF board members, uh, but I'm saying all these things because I believe in them and I really love what uh, they're all doing. Um, so I'd like to just provide a little historical context uh, and why commercial partnerships with NASA and other government agencies is the ideal approach um, to enable, uh, to. I'm taking advantage and leveraging these vehicles to enable more science and research. Um, a quick few points. Flying non-astronauts and citizen scientists to space have been the goal for a long time. In September 1969, just two months after the success of Apollo 11 mission, NASA advocated for a more balanced space program to maintain America's leadership in space. And as a part of that vision, NASA advocated for citizen scientists flying on human-tended missions uh, to a space station. Specifically, quote, um, staffed by specialists who do not need to be highly trained astronauts, but who are skilled in unique disciplines and collectively are capable of conducting a wide variety of activities in the fields of technology, science, and applications, end quote. I share this uh, with you because it shows the nation's original intent to include human-tended research in a post-Apollo world before um, uh, other things uh, uh, got involved regarding politics of you know, enabling that, that vision. 
Um, but I think it provides a powerful example for our continued push for human tended missions on commercial reusable suborbital, orbital flights and station platforms. Um, there are a number of reasons why uh, those things uh, didn't happen until recently. Uh, cost development overruns, overlapping high operational costs, cut into funding for science capabilities and research funding. Additionally, architectures that relied on single vehicle platforms, limited access. But with the onset of a number of commercial platforms coming online or, or online already, we have an opportunity to achieve that original goal by providing access with multiple low cost, reliable, reusable platforms. Um, NASA uh, has been a great partner and doing a great job at enabling science and research uh, and um, uh, towards achieving that uh, original goal. And uh, I'd really just like to um, thank NASA for working with us on uh, enabling things like Flat Opportunities Program, facilitating human tended research, standing up a subsea office, enabling commercial activities on uh, commercial crew vehicles and the International Space Station, and then uh, work towards having uh, multiple um, commercial platforms uh, to be accessed in LEO um, as we transition away from the space station uh, into the future. Um, and I'll end it there and uh, turn it back over to you, Phil. Thanks, Tommy. And thanks for the nice words about NASA. And full disclosure, NASA is not a board member of CSF. So those were heartfelt words uh, for Tommy, as were all of his words. So. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, Erica, you're next. Thanks, Phil. Uh, let me just open by first saying to everyone, happy National Astronaut Day. Uh, it's, it's always fun to be able to celebrate all of those who have laid the groundwork for the, these exciting things that we're doing today. And uh, you know, 60 years ago today, Alan Shepard encouraged us all to light this candle for the first time here in the U.S. And I, the, the legacy has just built and built from there. Uh, Blue Origin today is offering our very first ticket for sale on our uh, first New Shepard flight uh, coming up on July 20th. That's a, a big milestone and just really, really couldn't be more excited about that. But when we think about the, the things that we've been able to do with New Shepard already, payloads and research have been a huge part of that. The architecture has allowed us to, to do flight after flight after flight uh, up to the Kármán line and back and to really carry research with us. Uh, Ten of our flights have, have been doing science and technology development and education and art payloads uh, for such a wide range of audiences. And I think that that's something that we've seen as, as space has become more commercial is that those doors keep opening wider and wider. We've had payloads from seven different countries. We've had scientists and educators, uh, technology maturation, small businesses. It, it's really a, a very wide range of users that have come. Things like the Flight Opportunities Program in uh, STMD and now the Suborbital Crew Program in, in HEOMD are really starting to, to help us build an industry that enables itself. And it's really an interesting point, I think, that, that we can maybe talk about more in the Q&A, but about the ways that each of these commercial platforms is not just creating a market, but it's also strengthening the broader market uh, in the ways that it is showcasing new technologies, advancing uh, mission, mission essential operations, and really building that case forward. Uh, Sarisha mentioned the, the exciting things that come when we put astronauts uh, and science together. And I was just uh, reflecting on the, the last International Space Station mission. We had Kate Rubens uh, up on ISS, you know, a, a trained virologist with years and years of experience in the lab. Uh, same thing if you think back to Apollo 17 when we had uh, Jack Schmidt on the lunar surface as a trained geologist. When we put scientists with the science, we just get an incredible wealth of results uh, that happens. So I'm excited to see how suborbital crew, how the Flight Opportunities Program and others are able to really amp up the game of what we're able to achieve. There's also a really exciting piece of work here. I, I'm a space life scientist by training. I'm really excited to see what happens when we start to understand space medicine through the lens of all the rest of us. Uh, up until today, every space medicine study that's been done on the space shuttle or ISS has been done with really healthy 30 and 40 something year old astronauts. Uh, and th th that's awesome, but it's a limited spectrum of what we can understand. When we've been able to use a wider wider range of, of uh, spaceflight participants on, on things like parabolic flight studies, we've learned a lot more. 
So I'm, I'm really interested to see what kinds of new science we can discover and what kinds of, of new capabilities we can mature when we start to, to put these things uh, together and, and really bring the trained hands into the, into the game. So I'll just sort of say in, in closing, suborbital is a first step for Blue Origin. Uh, we have a, a vision of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. We've been able to use New Shepard as a stepping stone to New Glenn and our other programs and technologies and uh, look forward to bringing it to others as well. Okay, thanks very much, Erica. And um, July 20th, wow, big day. Please talk to Jeff Bezos. See if you can move that up two days because my birthday's July 18th. That would be a My birthday's real July 18th. Phil, you and I share a birthday. Oh my God, we didn't uh, know that. Wow. Nice. So that'd be a great birthday present, right? Uh, indeed. In the meantime, we'll celebrate the lunar landing as well. Yeah, right. Um, okay, thanks everybody. That was a super, uh, super good perspective from everybody. It was really cool to see how everybody's got a sort of a unique window into our industry and sort of talking about that. So I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists a question. It looks like we've got plenty of time. So for those in the quote unquote audience, uh, please submit your questions and we, will, we should have plenty of time for audience questions after that. So um, I'm gonna go back to Erica. With the moon on everybody's minds these days, uh, how is New Shepard helping with lunar science and technology development? That's a fun one. So a lot of people think of suborbital as you know a, a very small step, uh, and it turns out that it's a step that enables everything else that we do. So here at Blue Origin, we've been using New Shepard to mature our systems technologies and operations uh, for, for all of our other platforms. It's really been an incredible test bed for us. But we've also been able to use that uh, in a variety of our, our payload flights. So uh, two jump to mind. One is the tipping point flight that we did on our last pit, uh, payload mission with NASA. This was maturing technology relative navigation technologies. So we were actually using New Shepard to mimic a lunar lander coming in uh, from, from 100 kilometers above the lunar surface and using sensors on the outside of the vehicle to, to detect the terrain as we came down. So that gave us an, a chance to take that technology readiness level, that TRL, and really push it up till we can be uh, more certain and, and lower risk about putting that on, on other vehicles. The other thing that we've got coming up and just announced with, with STMD is a flight where we are uh, adjusting the capabilities of our reaction control system in our capsule to allow us to do partial gravity missions. So normally New Shepard goes up and it just does a, a big free floating parabola. Everything's in free fall. We're, we're studying a, a nice clean weightless environment. But gravitational researchers are really interested in that zone between zero G and one G. We don't know nearly as much about the moon and Mars and the effects on, on technologies, on, on science. So we're actually going to treat uh, New Shepard like a giant centrifuge. It's going to rotate at 11 RPM and give us a few minutes of contiguous uh, low gravity time so we can start to look at the, the effects there. And, and just to throw a little bit of science on the table, there was a great study that came out of Glenn Research Center a few years back where they had a, a small centrifuge in one of their drop towers. And in that short study, it appeared that things were actually more flammable on the moon and Mars than they were in either 0G or 1G. And that's because we, we have different processes that drive flames on Earth and in microgravity. Uh, and when we're in partial gravity, we actually get impacts of both of those. And so things become more flammable in those environments. So these turn out to be really important findings that allow us to, to tune the designs of our, our future spacecraft and, and our operations. Very good. Um, it's a little scary, uh, but uh, there's always more uh, things that we learn. And I think that's a really good answer, Erica, that exemplifies when you get these additional capabilities, people think of cool ways to use them and things to do. Partial gravity is not something we ever had access to. And now with that capability, scientists, researchers, they just use their creative juices and just go crazy. We're finding an element of that on the International Space Station right now with commercial crew and with the ability of putting that extra crew member on the ISS almost exclusively de devoted to science. One of the things that's been one of the real constraints on our researchers is crew time. So they've had to really automate their systems significantly. And now we're going back to that research community and say, hey, think about what it was 10 years ago when you didn't have to automate everything. Now you've got people that can intervene and do things. What can you do? And they're like, oh, my God, that's such a gift. Let me think about it for a month. But uh, they get really excited about it. So um, I, it's again, just what I said in the beginning, this synergistic relationship between the capabilities and what, you know, the people going up and what they're gonna do. And so uh, 
Good answer, Erica. So now I'll switch to Sarisha. I think Sarisha Virgin has had the unique uh, uh, situation where you've had access to your customer base for a while now, right? You've had customers that have signed up. You've been able to interact with that customer base. And so you've been able to sort of see what they want and what they like and what they don't like. And so going back to your original comments where you saw you really seeing a lot of excitement from this community that enables the researchers to fly with their payloads. What, uh, if you could break that down a little bit, what communities are you seeing the most interest with that capability? Is it government researchers, commercial uh, researchers, other commercial operators or application um, users? Where's that community? Where's the excitement for that capability really coming from in the community? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have had access to our community for a while. Um, we have over 600 people signed up to fly uh, from the tourism side. Um, and I know this diverts from your question a bit, and I will get to your answer, but um, that, that community of future astronauts have been incredible. Um, the, the reason uh, behind why they want to fly, um, the impact they're looking to have with their community after they fly uh, is just uh, kind of showcases um, there isn't just one reason why people want to go to space. Um, and it's not just one type of person. Um, so the, that um, interaction with our community has been just so fulfilling. Um, they've uh, they're still they're still very much excited to fly and be a part of this community and be able to take their experience and give back, whether it's to students or the communities um, that they've come from. And it's not just U.S. people; it's people all across the globe. And those, especially that don't have uh, a strong space presence in their country, it is especially exciting. Um, for the research community, we've seen a lot in terms of the human tender research. It, it really does vary. Um, we've had a lot for technology demonstrations. Um, Alan Stern uh, was, was chosen through the flight opportunities to fly and he's going to be flying a payload uh, to take uh, observations out our windows um, and to test that tech. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, uh, interest in the biomedical community as I, I know Erica has mentioned um, to take, uh, to, to be able to understand and take measurements on the people that are, are going to be flying. It's a completely different subset than have that, than the people that have been flying uh, to date, um, which are very fit, um, have been trained quite a while to fly. Um, so there has been a lot of interest in seeing uh, and collecting data from a different uh, demographic of people that will be flying into space. Uh, but really it has, Expand the gambit, <laughs> um, it, and I'm really excited to see what other ideas come through. And uh, one, I just want to put one ad addition to Erica's comments as well. Um, we've seen also uh, a lot of researchers um, using suborbital platforms to test out technologies before going to the moon or before going to uh, orbit, and that those longer journeys. And we've had a payload um, on our first space flight that didn't actually work to plan <laughs> as planned, and they were able to refly two months later um, and get that, their technology right. Um, and that, that payload can now go and have a much more, uh, I guess, confidence that, of their success rate in a longer uh, flight. So um, there have been quite a few, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the interest has really spanned the spectrum of the communities. That's really good to hear, Sarisha. To echo what Christian said, you really want a diversity in your customer base, right? You don't want all your eggs in one basket. So hearing that you're getting interest across the board, uh, that's very encouraging. Um, so with that, we'll actually go to Christian. Uh, Christian, I think you're in the unique situation of Axiom Space is right in the thick of some very, very expensive development, uh, which is great. Um, so you are probably, I know maybe not you personally, this isn't your personal uh, title, but obviously Axiom is having to interact with the capital markets significantly, trying mm -hmm. to raise money, seeing where that revenue is going to come from. From your perspective, how do you see the capital markets reacting to all this activity in space? Well, you're right. It's not my area, but uh, we are. We have raised significant capital. We've raised 150 million dollars to date. Our last round was 130 earlier this year. Um, but capital markets uh, have reacted in, in a couple different ways. One, the the emerging SPAC market that has has transitioned into uh, fruition, I, say, I guess, so to speak, has created a lot of new funding opportunities for 
mid-sized space companies as they're trying to raise capital to grow. But there seems to be an emerging and growing interest from the pure or the traditional VC market as well. We've had we we had um, certainly an an oversubscription of interest in terms of our recent round, and we have an oversubscription in next rounds as well. And you know that what that speaks to is uh, the interest in the space arena in general. There seem to be a lot of capital interest in just moving into space areas. Now, what I'll tell you though is that an investor is an investor is an investor, and it's still about mitigating risk and maximizing return. And so. At the end of the day, it has to be uh, an investment that makes sense for the investor. It has to be an investment that ma matches their risk posture, and it has to be an investor or an investment that matches their horizon goals. And so what I've seen is that there is a growing interest in uh, investors that are not in it necessarily for the, the early quick win, but are in it for the long haul. And that seems to be our portfolio of investors too, including our lead on the last round, C5. They, under, they understand that... Uh, the, the market needs to mature over time and it's going to take time to do that. And it's also going to take time to build the space station. But then they also look at how we diversify the portfolio of offerings that we have in space uh, with the expansion capabilities and recognize that it's a, it's a risk mitigated return opportunity. And with all of the, the entrance into the space arena, both into the orbital and the suborbital space, it just it ultimately drives um, you know, market development. I think it's going to be important um, as we talk about transitioning uh, markets to LEO, as we talk about um, developing markets in LEO first, it, it, or, it, excuse me, developing markets uh, additionally in space and making them grow, making that whole pie grow bigger, that, um, you know, that there's sustained signals from both commercial and government to use it when we go there. And I think that's going to be an important part of investor uh, optimism in future space benefits is the, is the, uh, from a U.S. government side, it's going to be certainly important to signal kind of um, the importance for sustained funding to develop demand um, in in space. And so, uh, with NASA, for example, being interested in being a, a one of many users in orbit, it'll be terrific to see if if this new Congress and this new administration can really help focus um, funding both at NASA and other agencies to really build demand both for suborbital and orbital. And in and in return. What I think that does is really postures the United States well in a in a place that really sets us off as a as a leader in maintaining our U.S. leadership in space from a commercial perspective, bringing in all of those international customers seeking access to space and creating that marketplace the way we need to. So the 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 interest has been strong, and um, I hope it continues. Christian, excellent answer. Are you sure this isn't your area of expertise? Because you knocked that one out of the park. Uh, that was a really, really good answer. Um, yeah. That's my experience as well. So, um, okay, on to Tommy. Tommy, uh, you've got the unique perspective of seeing the industry as a whole, right? You've got a whole lot of companies that are part of the Federation. Um, you get a lot of time, FaceTime with them or video time, however it may be, and getting to see how that, how the, how our industry is evolving. And so I'd like you to just take a few minutes on your perspective about our industry and not just the unicorns and butterflies, but do you see any dark clouds? Is there any place where our industry maybe isn't as healthy as it could be? Just sort of give us the whole um, sort of your perspective on, on, on the health and well-being of the industry today. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. I, that's uh, quite the softball you got, you gave me there. <laughs> um, well, I think the, um, uh, first thing is that, you know, it's been wonderful working um, with such a uh, brilliant group of people that uh, um, work really, really hard uh, towards a similar goal. Um, and even though they're competitors, they most of the time put aside their, um, uh, the competitive aspect um, to drive towards um, the ultimate goal that we're all trying to reach for, which is a healthy ecosystem for all the commercial players to compete in. Um, and so uh, I, I think that aspect is just absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and that's what uh, enables uh, CSF to, to really function and do what it does. And so I really, really enjoy that. Um, I think that it's important to, uh, um, for folks to understand um, and have uh, regarding expectations of, you know, markets. Um, you know, I, I, I like a Shakespeare quote of, you know, the root of all heartache is uh, expectation. 
Uh, and so if your expectations of what should happen um, don't align with, you know, how things actually happen, then, you know, that's where you run into problems. And so, you know, uh, speaking of the dark clouds, I don't think it's really dark clouds so much as, you know, I think it's important expectation wise for people to understand that, you know, for markets to function um, successfully, you know, there will, people will succeed and others will, uh, and ideas will fail. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, commercial space is a failure. Actually, that's a signal that it's actually being successful. You know, I, I like the example of, you know, there's a ton of uh, restaurants that open up, you know, in DC and, you know, some, you know, are here for the longevity, um, um, but others uh, open and close regularly. Um, but, you know, when, it, when a restaurant closes that, that, you know, there isn't a huge hysteria, you know, from people that live in DC that, the restaurant market is actually failing and that, you know, we should have never agreed to um, uh, privatizing the restaurant market because, you know, that that's, it's just not working out. So, you know, having that sort of um, uh, perspective, I think is important as, you know, we, we get into the point of there's a significant number of companies that continues to grow and which is fantastic. Um, but there, but there will be some ideas that, that fail um, and that's okay. Um, and so uh, I think that, you know, we're that that's where we're sort of heading We're you know, we've we've dealt with and we're we're starting to achieve the most important thing, uh, which is the foundation for all of this, which is low cost, reliable access to space and everything else is building off of that. And that's where we're sort of at right now is the building off of that. And we'll start to see ideas, you know, fail and succeed. But, you know, as long as that fundamental um, stays strong, then I think we have a really bright future. That's an, that's an excellent point, uh, Tommy. We, we tend, I don't know about those of us in the industry, but certainly our stakeholders sometimes tend to overreact to certain things. Uh, it's kind of like uh, sports media, like the Dodgers came out, they're super hot, went 13 and two, and everyone's like, oh, they're going to win the World Series. Well, now they're four and 10, right? It's a long slog, right? And there are going to be companies that fall by the wayside and don't, uh, don't succeed. And that doesn't um, it doesn't have any implications really for the overall health of the industry, other than people are taking some risks and maybe going too far, and those are going to get weeded out. To leverage that, we're also going to see technical failures, right? Uh, we're going to see probably some big explosions, and uh, as we've seen with Starship, uh, which have been really exciting to watch, uh, but other test failures, those are not failures in this. We call them anomalies. We're trying to rebrand that because they really are just anomalies that you can learn from. They're not failures. When you have a test program, it's designed to uh, flesh out those things that might not be designed optimally. So I think all of us in the community, not just our industry, but in the community at large, um, need to expect that. That's, that's a really good point, Tommy. All right, you guys, excellent, excellent panel. I'm going to turn it over to the audience. I hope uh, there's a queue of questions, but if not, I've got a bunch more that I can go to. So, Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, we do have a few opportunities to talk on things that have already been said and uh, some new activities, new questions. And one of them goes back to uh, part of the reasons that we're all doing this, and that is uh, how do we bring forth students and how do we get students into our programs? So, given the current cost of rides to space, including the cost on y'all's programs. How do uh, researchers and others with limited funding get ac access to what you're doing and access to rights to space and access to long-term activity in space? And we'll make that as, as Sharisha said earlier, we'll make that to the entire panel and give you all an opportunity to speak for a sentence or two. Go ahead, Sharisha. Yeah, I can yep. start. Um, so I, I mean, I think one, the payloads that students um, fly are much smaller and typically less complex than uh, typical researcher payloads, and those are a smaller dollar amount. Um, and it's something that I, that can be raised through like PTOs or you know, uh, and uh, like other student activities. That being said, uh, flight opportunities um, does have funding for educational payloads and um, is. That is one opportunity where um, a, a PI can actually engage the community that um, they're working in to fly an educational payload or uh, work with the community 
on an educational aspect for their payload through flight opportunities funding. Um, and those uh, uh, calls come out twice a year. Um, so definitely encourage uh, all PIs that want to be able to um, work with their community or bring in that aspect uh, to take a look at that. Um, and you obviously can provide resources for that as well. Um, so I, I think there's definitely funding opportunities. The dollar amount is, uh, I think, much smaller than uh, what, typ what typically people think about when flying to space. I think all of a sudden it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's, it's not. Um, so I, I do think it's accessible and there are funding opportunities to do that. Um, and the other item I, I'd say is that um, there's a lot of programs uh, that also provide um, educational curriculum. You don't have to fly a payload to space, but you can use this curriculum to talk about space-based research um, and, and really the design build fly process. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there to, um, to take part of, of this community. Yeah, I'll just follow up on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you know, Sarisha put it really well. There's so many opportunities for students to, to touch space as part of their, their educational journey. Right now, we actually have two contests that are, are going on right now. Uh, if for high, high school students, the AIAA Design Build Launch Competition, uh, and for high school and, and and older college college and graduate students, uh, the American Society for Gravitational and Space Research's Kensuza competition. And those are ways for students to get free opportunities to fly their, their ideas to space. Uh, our, our ticket that's going on, on sale today for New Shepard, all the proceeds from that are going to Club for the Future, which is our 501c3 that's designed to get kids excited about careers and opportunities in STEM and STEAM and the future of space. So I, I think investing in that next generation is absolutely something that we all try to do. Uh, very, very important. Any others? All right. Well, I got, Alan, I got my strategy. Uh, I'm going to defend brief befriend and billionaire. That is my strategy. Uh, obviously, before, right? Uh, he bought a whole mission and he's given away seats. So I'm going to try and find a billionaire to befriend. <laughs> All right. Uh, Christian, a uh, question regarding Axiom. Um, and this may be way early, but uh, is there any cis lunar plans in your program? I would say yes, that's way early to really talk about. But what I would talk about is in terms of, of what we are doing. We, we believe in kind of a sustainable infrastructure layer in low Earth orbit is, is, essential, is essential for ultimately sustained exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And so our investments in low Earth orbit infrastructure uh, as much as possible will be translatable to cislunar opportunities later on. At the end of the day, we are building space stations. You can put them in orbit around Earth. You can put them in orbit around the moon. Um, and the technologies that go into sustaining human life in those, in those spacecraft are the same technologies that you can put you know, on a planetary body surface that ultimately in, maybe in some modified format to sustain life on the surface. So what I would tell you is that the architecture we're putting in place for low Earth orbit is extensible. But right now as a company, we're, we're really motivated to really build the, the low Earth orbit infrastructure layer in a way that helps sustain those that want to go further and, and farther. Right. Tomio, one for you. This is uh, looking outward, uh, outside the United States a bit. And um, this is DeLuna's question. So I'm going to work on it as, as we go. And Phil knows some of those questions go astray sometimes. But uh, internationally, uh, when you look at what's happening in launch vehicles, the Europeans have driven folks to use European launch vehicles. The US has driven folks, US folks to use US launch vehicles. Asia is going to drive people, even in China, outside of China, um, are going to drive people to use Asian launch vehicles. Long time ago, we, not a long time ago, a couple of years ago, we said that you know, only two or three big or maybe four big companies could build launch vehicles. And now almost anybody that can get a college degree can get enough reference material and a few dollars and build a launch vehicle. It's happening all over the world, multiple places in Europe, South America, Asia, and in the US. Now we've got some international folks coming in and going to be building space stations, stations to go around the world. Um, and 
do some of the same kinds of things that Erica and Sharisha and Christian have said they're going to be doing. What is the international competition going to do to or for our domestic suppliers of zero or microgravity research, either suborbital, orbital, or long-term duration like Christian's going to do? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that uh, competition is always good. Um, it uh, improves people's ideas, products, and, um, and uh, services. Uh, and I think we're uh, reaping the benefits of it now. And, you know, a lot of the problems and, you know, reasons that a lot of this hadn't, hasn't come to fruition until now is a lack of competition, um, both internally and externally. Um, but uh, the one caveat I'd say to that, especially uh, involving international competition, is that the competition needs to be, um, you know, fair. Uh, and that, um, uh, you know, uh, figuring out, you know, what is fair competition so that um, folks aren't putting their thumb too much on the scale uh, in their favor uh, is important. But, you know, everybody, transparency and, and, and a fair set of rules that everybody can agree to, I think, uh, are important principles for um, uh, competition. So uh, follow up on that. Are you suggesting that we may end up in the same kind of arena that we are in aircraft manufacturing with uh, subsidi subsidies from uh, governments supporting aircraft manufacturing ending up in uh, world court type areas where you decide that there's been unfair uh, support? No, I, I think that we, uh... I'm not suggesting that at all. I think that um, you know we do a pretty good job of keeping an eye on and um, working, keeping an eye on and working with uh, policymakers, stakeholders in in DC um, to ensure that uh, that um, uh, that it does it doesn't get to that point. Uh, so um, no. I think the uh, capabilities that all of our companies and a lot of U.S. commercial companies and NASA is providing is actually creating a really great opportunity for international collaboration um, with, com with countries that have a strong space program and especially providing access for countries that don't have a native uh, or national launch capability. Um, and I think that's a really interesting and positive side for all of the, the progress that we've made. Um, and that spans for uh, research, I think, it, especially for research, um, being able to work with uh, global organizations. Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of progress there with all the capabilities coming to market. Yeah, I think about the suborbital crew program that's coming down through the, the ranks right now. It's going to create a, you know, a systems qualification for, for vehicles that are flying commercially here in the US. And you could imagine that same sort of reciprocity that we've seen uh, from FAA certification for, for aircraft, um, you know, that, that others would say, ah, you know, if NASA can, can trust these, these companies and these vehicles enough to put its, its own civil servants on board, so can we. And that creates opportunities for, for other uh, national space agencies, international companies, uh, other U.S. government agencies to, to take advantage of, of that that investment that NASA is making and that the commercial industry is making. So I, I'm hopeful as well. But as Tommy said, we, we have to figure out ways to make sure that this stays a, a level playing field. Okay, reflecting on a, a little bit of, of that, um, back a few years ago, uh, we thought that when we created the commercial mission specialist position on shuttle, that we were going to have an explosion of commercial astronauts wanting to take their research in orbit and do their research on the shuttle and come back. And we continue that thought process into ISS. So for the, the three of you, and then Tommy, if you want to jump in, how much of your long-term, not your short-term right now flashing the pan, but long-term customer base you think is going to be based upon astronauts and astronaut access versus production of stuff that you can only do in, in space versus research. Have any ideas on those kinds of splits and timelines for those? I think I'll take a first crack at that um, since we're probably <clears throat> thinking about it as much or more than anyone else at the moment. And you know, the there is always going to be a market in space for human tended research and human tended manufacturing. There's never going to be um, a, a true uh, 
optimization to the point where everything is automatic and everything is robotic and everything is is automated. I mean, even if you look at industry today, there's still, for example, just reading in recent news, there's a tremendous um, problem in the U.S. manufacturing sector today because there are, are skilled workers needed everywhere across the country and not enough workers to do it, speaking to the point that human interaction in a manufacturing environment is still very much needed. And so um, I think what you're going to see is as the market matures and as more and more use cases come up, industrialized research opportunities, um, basically programs or, or, or systems in place that are on board that, that generate data as a product, uh, a sellable product, um, whether you see it as a manufacturing opportunity that's scalable, where uh, manufactured good needs some human expertise on board to build final product, you're going to see a driving demand for, for uh, space flyers, humans in space. And so, you know, it's going to be a question of whether those vendors, those purveyors of research, those purveyors of manufacturing are going to ultimately want to buy that as a service where there's a service company out there providing that expertise or whether they want to fly their own personnel. It's probably going to be a mix of both. Um, and from the early conversations that I've seen, I think there is a lot of interest in the uh, company specific tended uh, work tended by a company employee. I think what everyone appreciates though is the is the uh, the length of time scale it's going to take to get that to that kind of size of acti activity and in in infrastructure on orbit. And so in the interim, I suspect that you'll see uh, centralization of the astronaut capability in some ways that provides services to a number of different clients at the same time. Um, that's kind of where I see happening. But research is going to be a, a, a growing opportunity as as volume and, and capability on in mean, space grow where there's more research opportunities. And so manufacturing is on a little bit further horizon scale where those early test cases on ISS are ultimately going to pave the way for you know manufacturing demos on Axiom Station that will move into more production level work probably in the next five to seven years. That's my my quick look at it. Yeah, I don't. Have, I mean, I don't have too much uh, addition to that. Um, I mean, I. I mentioned that we had over 600 people signed up to fly as a future astronaut, as a tourist. Um, and when we opened up our One Small Step program, we had you know, around a thousand people register interest as well. Um, so that uh, market of um, tourism we've seen um, there and continue to be strong. Um, it, we opened up some opportunities for research. Um, it was grabbed up pretty quickly. We have a flight with the Italian Air Force um, as well to do human tended research. And we've seen a lot of interest from, uh, you know, global research uh, institutions that don't have that capability um, in their country to, to be able to fly research and fly with their research. So uh, I probably throw it over to Erica to talk a little bit more about the research market. Um, but uh, from the tourism side, we've seen uh, a lot of interest in, in a growth there as well. Yeah, we I agree wholeheartedly. And we don't, what we've seen historically with NASA is it takes a long time for basic research to become productized. Um, even the work that's going on right now on space station for, for fiber optic cables, which everyone's so excited about, uh, ZBLAN and other, other specialty optics, comes from work that was done on parabolic and, and suborbital flights at NASA in the 1980s. Uh, I think when we look at the work that, that Merck's been doing with Keytruda, which is some great advances in extending the efficacy and, and uh, cost effectiveness of, of their, their drugs in the market, that's a story of more than a decade of research on, on space shuttle and space station. So these, these things aren't fast. Uh, my hope is that as we start to lower the barriers to entry, that those cycle times increase and it's not uh, do an experiment and then wait five years to get your next one up, but that we get to start to, to increase that, that recurrence time, that that helps a lot. And also as the, we move into commercial markets and the intellectual property regimes change in low earth orbit and on in suborbital, where companies are willing to invest because the IP stays with them, that we see more investment coming uh, and more opportunities that, that grow. I just wanted to, I mean, we've been talking a lot about some of the applications of uh, the capabilities and most of it has been focused on uh, not aerospace work. <laughs> um, and so interesting because uh, NASA is the, you know, the agency to go to for space flight and all, all of the work, the space-based research. Um, but it's interesting to see how we'll progress moving forward with other government agencies. And we, we've talked a lot about biomedical 
uh, research where, uh, you know, I could see NIH um, and in the future NSF and uh, other, other agencies interested in, the, in using the capabilities we're providing for research. And it'd be, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of a whole of government approach when it comes to uh, microgravity access and microgravity research in the future, because a lot of the applications we're talking about, while yes, they're done in space, have a lot of different applications on earth too. Yeah, I would actually, I'd add on to that a little bit. I think the conversation, you know, what we need to do as an industry is change the conversation of do your science in space to do your science in a unique environment you can't find anywhere else. And really, when you translate it that way, when you talk about it as a unique laboratory that, that doesn't exist anywhere else, it's really, it's, you know, whether that laboratory is on a mountain in Chile or whether that laboratory is in space, as long as you lower the barriers to entry such that it's easy to get, easy to use. And, in, and as Erica alluded to, we increase the cycle times to move at the pace of commercial. I think we can be really successful. Um, there's a lot of work to go into that. And, and so we've got, to, we've got to figure out how we implement that together. But if we can change the language around it where space is, you know, where is this? Oh, by the way, it's in low earth orbit. When, it, when that becomes a secondary discussion to the opportunity that microgravity provides, then we've really, we've really been successful. Yeah, this idea that you have to be a space company to do things in space is a really funny one because you know, yeah. Merck is now a space company. Delta Faucet is a space company. Uh, GM is a space company. Good we, we, we should space we should company. be Goodyear's a space company. We we uh, this is this is changing fast. One overall question, first for Tommy and then for Phil, um, and we'll close out on this. And I'm turning this into an overall question instead of a specific question to one of the panelists as it was presented. Uh, first, Tommy, and then Phil, what do you see from looking at the overall environment and the overall industry? What do you see as the biggest bottlenecks that folks are facing over the next three to five years? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say uh, two things. Um, uh, integrating a more seamless integration into um, the airspace with other airspace users is an important one uh, and modernizing those tools um, uh, so that we all have equal ac access, I think is important. Um, and then the other one is, uh, you know, you see a lot of a lot of these capabilities, some are already online, they're coming online. You know, a really important thing to do is and ensure is that, um, uh, government agencies don't just um, do a, um, a uh, check the box of we tried it, it's great, but um, you know, we're going to buy on need and that normally means not going to buy it. So um, uh, on ramping these capabilities into a normal acquisition process to buy these services um, is important and those are the two areas for me. Okay, good question, Alan. What I would say is historically, those bottlenecks have either been in human capital or financial capital. I don't think those exist so much anymore. Uh, to dovetail on what Christian said, the capital markets seem to be reacting pretty favorably to space applications, space companies. Human capital, I'm seeing an amazing influx of diverse, smart, young people into our industry that we have never seen before, which is super exciting for me uh, to see that. What I would say we need to focus on, I'm not, I don't know if this is necessarily a bottleneck, uh, Alan, but what I would say to the panelists, to our industry as a whole, the key to making this work is getting non-government customers. I'm really kind of pleased to hear how Many times NASA was mentioned by our panelists and in this conversation, but it also makes me a little uncomfortable. Uh, it can't be, we, we need to focus on business opportunities. It can't just be the government. Um, and the key to getting those non-government customers is cost effectiveness. We need this industry laser-like focused on cost effectiveness. That is the difference, I think, that has been um, in our, introduced in our industry over the last 15 years, as opposed to the prior 15 years, where everything was expensive, it only got more expensive, and it was we were putting ourselves out of business, essentially. In these last 15 years, we've seen things actually come down a little bit, 
dramatically so in some cases, but we need them to continue to come down so that we can really get these non-government customers. I don't want NASA to be the main source of anybody's business plan uh, in low Earth orbit. We've got our sights set on the moon and Mars. We are going to be going into deep space. We're never going to leave LEO. We're always going to have probably some suborbital applications that we're going to, or services that we're going to need. But for our industry as a whole, we really have to focus on cost effectiveness and non-government customers or our visions are not going to um, be realized. All right, great panel. Thank you very much, Phil, Tommy, Erica, Charisha and Christian. And uh, thank you for your patience uh, as we brought up a little bit late, but we're, we're done uh, pretty close to on time as we announced uh, earlier in, uh, at 1.45. We're now going to take about a 10 or a 12 minute break and pick back up at 2 p.m. Eastern. Please come back then to our Goddard Plus with Nikki Fox. Thank you very much. We'll see you at two o'clock.